We've had some wonderful reflections this morning on a, a number of things that have a lot of data associated with them, a lot of research associated with them. But I'm going to say to you that I think there's still something missing to this conversation. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an object of study for educators who, especially like myself, have a lot of years in this business. Uh, we, you know, we've been teaching for 20 some odd years and then we start seeing our students who we taught in the early years coming back or doing things with their lives and we become aware of this dynamic of how we take young people, people in kindergarten, first and second grade, and then what they become later in life. And I guess the first place to really start reflecting on this, if you want to get philosophical, is to go back to your own roots. So you may not think so, but that's me. That's me in seventh grade. That's me right before I got up on a stage at my junior high school and said to a group of people about five times the size of this, that I wanted to be treasurer, not president, just treasurer in the student body, and that my credential was that I was the president of the Aquarium Club. Now, what could you imagine followed that? It was the most explosive laughter you have probably ever heard in a junior high school gymnasium that was just absolutely devastating to me at that moment in my life. And yet, I weathered that and went on to do this. So you have to ask yourself the question about those early moments in your life, and you've all had them. How did they turn from this into what you are becoming today? And how do they connect us from what we were to what we will become. This kid looks like a pretty normal kid. He's an individual, if I were to tell you the story though, that grew up adopted. Parents gave him away. And another family adopted him. He grew up with an adoptive family. Always wondered about his life. Never really fit in in school had lots of ideas that lots of people didn't see any utility in, didn't fit people's thinking at the time. He was an outcast. He tried college, didn't really work for him. And yet, this is what he became. What happened between this and this? What were the things that shaped this life? We can't point to education. We can't point to anything specific. But there is this pathway that emerges from being young to doing something. And with still, with all the research and all the stories and everything that you've heard, it is still intangible to us. It is still intangible how we create this from that. There's another boy. A boy born in mediocrity. Uh, had one father, gave that up for another father, moved around the world. A third culture kid, not unlike you. Lived in Thailand for a while, lived in other places around the world. What is it that took this and gave us this. What is it about this transition in life that takes children and shapes them and molds them over 20 plus years into what they become? And in both of these cases, it was in many ways someone escaping from the paradigms that we create for ourselves. They weren't shaped by the educational system because oftentimes, as we all know, education seeks a middle ground rather than the outliers. What is it that we need to do 
to begin to think differently about how we move from young to accomplished. One more. This little kid didn't speak until he was three years old. In our current day educational system, and this was quite a while ago, but in our educational system, he would be in special ed programs being assessed for deficits. He would be identified as a special ed child. He'd be grouped. He'd be instrumentally services applied to try to fix him. And in the process of doing that, as Kathy Davidson talked about in her book, Now You See It, we would be molding and filtering his world to something we can accept, not something that's necessarily in his frame of reference. She wrote in her book, and it's proven in the research, when you're born, you're born with the ability, the innate ability to speak every language. That your dominance in one language comes from the way society shapes you and the way your parents interact with you and the way in which you interact with each other shapes who you become. So who is this kid who didn't talk? He did go on to learn the violin. He seemed to be quite gifted at it. But even that didn't hold his attention. Instead, what we got was this. And even until very late in his life, he maintained that sense of playing with his world. He maintained that sense of connecting with his life and with the things around him. And he had tremendous insight into what it was we needed to understand beyond those around him. We have another one in our midst that's emerging right now. She's talked about often in the news. We all know Malala. We all know about her challenge. We all know how she was impacted by her choices. But there's an interesting sub-story here. This gal will do amazing things. She will surmount this challenge and she will go on to be a leader. I know it in my heart. I know it in my gut. I know every instinct that says to me, she will do great things. In the, in the aftermath, in all the praise of her, in in fact the renaming of her school as the Malala Institute, what is happening now is that the women who were closest to her the girls who were studying with her are begging and pleading with the government to name their school back to what it was. They don't want to be a target. They want to live in something simpler that doesn't frame them in her reference. That's the challenges we face is these paradigms that keep people from addressing the changes we need to make. The things we need to find in people are not often taught in our educational system and they require us to think about something differently. So we need to look at these concepts of leadership. So this is Bernard Bass, right? And he's talking about this is what leadership is. And I would argue, turn it around. Use this to look at how we interact with youth. How do we inspire youth and give them opportunities to inspire others? How do we allow people like the leaders here today, like the ones in your student government, like the ones that are in your classes every day, how do we give them opportunities to influence people by their own actions? How do we make sure we know you? How is it that we can make sure that you know each other so that you really understand what it is you want, what it is you see, and what it is you aspire to? Because it's that passionate voice that will make all the difference in the future. And then intellectually, as we heard this morning, is the path really sitting in the classroom? 
Is the path really in the lecture halls of 300? Is that really the path of the future? I'm not convinced. Education is rife with a big problem, and that is our underestimation of potential. We perpetuate boundaries, and stripping those down is hard work because even in the most recent of weeks, the focus is on GPA, is on homework load, is on scales, is on one through seven. The focus is all about accomplishment in terms that many of us do not find inspiring. We need to flip this. We need to find a better way. And the people in this audience are the people that are going to make that happen. Kofi Annan said in his speech to the Nobel Committee as he received his prize that today's real boundaries, borders are not between states, but between powerful and powerless, free and fettered, privileged and humiliated. And I would make that simpler and simply say the boundaries and borders that are most daunting are the ones we create for ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>